This week on Quality Digest Live, are smart devices really all that smart of an idea? Good question. Plus, we chat with Martin Volk of TubeSued about the EU's general data protection regulation. That and more when we come back. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for February 9th, 2018. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. That's true, and I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. <clears throat> Not all of you probably take notes in electronic forms, but I'm guessing that a lot of you do. So for instance, you might be using electronic records for Kappa and other QMS related activities. And I suspect that you may be making some of the same mistakes that harried doctors and other healthcare professionals are making. According to news from UCLA, recent studies, uh, a recent study shows that doctors have some efficiency habits that lead to inaccurate data entry and that they can record better notes after getting some instruction on best practices. And this is referring to how doctors fill out, uh, doctors and other healthcare workers fill out uh, electronic health records. Some of their mistakes or time-saving methods are, let's say, at a minimum, not providing useful information or, worst case, they are propagating old data or mistakes down the line, but it isn't just doctors. Electronic note taking exists in almost all industries. And we've seen, I mean, we talk a lot about uh, QMS software, mm -hmm. which uses a lot of the same ideas. You're, you're diagnosing a problem, you're creating a, you know, a kappa, and very often you're updating status on maybe a daily or a weekly uh, basis. And so you're constantly taking notes yeah. and putting, inputting data into a form. And I think the same errors happen in that as what we were talking about with the doctors. So here's a couple of the uh, two or three of the problems that we're talking about. One big one, we all do this, it's called copying forward. This is when you take old information. This could be a status information on a problem. It could be symptoms. Anything related, let's say, to an ongoing investigation. And you copy and paste those notes from into a new form. Because a lot of the information is the same. Why should I type this all over again? I'm just going to copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is that unless um, you take the time to actually review the information, you may be populating your new form with outdated or incorrect information. So obviously what you want to do, copy and paste, sure, maybe that makes sense. You've got a stu lot of stuff written down, a lot of it is repetitive, mm -hmm. but you want to go through and make sure, has any of this changed and do the notes actually need to be updated be after I copy and paste? Right. Another problem, <laughs> another thing all of us do is, and so many electronic forms have this, is the auto-populate or auto-fill function that kind of fills in, fills in spaces as you're typing. It kind of looks ahead, you've typed this information before, sure. and it auto-fills it for you. Again, a time saver, but the secret here is to look at and assess what is being, that what is being auto-filled is Correct. And I don't mean that it's it's completely wrong that you you know you you put in the wrong word or the wrong function or whatever. I mean, is it really what you want to say? Because mm -hmm. I think we get we get lazy and it auto populates. It fills in the blank and it goes ah okay well yeah that's close enough close enough right <laughs> uh, and, and I'm, I'm you know I'm not but no if it's not really what you're trying to say manually type it in. Mm -hmm. This last one I love for for both people like me I, we should pay attention to this input in your notes, only relevant information. We have all seen forms that look like somebody's <laughs> master's thesis. Is all that information really necessary? Be concise. Um, sometimes you want to you get all the facts in there and be complete, but somebody has to read this. Mm -hmm. And if the stuff that you're filling in doesn't really completely pertain to the problem at hand and what's being dealt with, it's kind of uh, superfluous, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's not really adding to sol solving that particular problem. Right, yeah. and, and you know, we all fall into that because you want to be complete. You want to be complete. You really yeah. want to be complete, and, and, but you know, many times, I mean, for me, I'm the one who's reading the notes again. And right. a month later, 
Right. So I have to go through and I'm like, what, what, why you know, did why I was, write yeah, all, what this? Is all this? <laughs> what is but you know, the thing is, you don't always know what's going to be relevant. There's reasons for being that right. that complete too. But you know, there's, well, there's pros and cons. It was interesting. So yeah. they 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 uh, took this group of doctors and they they taught them some best practices mm -hmm. and note and note taking. This is what was interesting in the study by, by UCLA. Researchers found that by prompting the doctors to document only what is relevant for that day, and by limiting efficiency tools, limiting efficiency tools such as copying forward and mm -hmm. autofill, the progress notes were significantly improved for quality, were shorter in length, and were completed more quickly. So this is, I mean, electronic mm -hmm. record keeping uh, it makes it easy to, to do a lot of things. It also makes it easy to take shortcuts, but not all shortcuts are good and pay attention to what you're putting in that form. Yeah, the counterintuitive nature of that, because all these tools are designed to make your life easier. To make it easier. And more efficient and better, and better quality, but in retrospect, really, it, it takes away from all those things. Well, the, the interesting thing is, is in, in some forms, copying forward mm -hmm. isn't just cut and paste, it's actually a button. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, just copy from last yeah. time. Boink. You hit a button, boink, oh, it's there, okay, down, and now I can move on. That's even, more insidious you're not than even copy. looking you're not even it. looking yeah, at yeah, it you're just hitting it. the hitting the copy forward button yeah, and yeah i mean it's it you know notes i mean garbage in garbage out is the, it, is the it, phrase you always use so yeah if you're going to rely on your notes or other people are make sure they're as accurate as they possibly can be there you go yeah, good good stuff there all right well now it seems that everywhere you look these days dirk you know this you see smart things right yes you see smart <laughs> things you see smart phones yes, we aren't looking at each other that's right you see smart <laughs> factories you see smart cities there right yep Every once in a while, you see a smart publisher. <laughs> Again, not around here not around often, here, but, but <laughs> sometimes, every once in a while, you get lucky. Just because it's connected doesn't mean it's smart, is the name of the latest article from QD's prolific contributing editor, Ryan Day. Now, if you know Ryan, uh, you know that on occasion, just on the rarest of occasions, <laughs> he gets the smallest of burrs under his saddle really? about something. Well, lucky for us, this is one of those times because we can enjoy his, his discomfort <laughs> and his perspective. As I mentioned a moment ago, there are a lot of connected devices in the world. Now, when I first heard the phrase Internet of Things, for instance, a couple years ago, I remember wondering, well, how could a thing be connected to the Internet? Right, right. right? I mean, just what kind of things are these anyway? <laughs> right? I mean, sounds kind of scary. Well, the short answer is that these things are um, everything. I mean, it's today, it's everything, yeah. almost literally. As Ryan points out in his article, that means products like the Smalt, <laughs> a, a table centerpiece that not only acts as a salt shaker, but also monitors your sodium intake. In addition to that, the Smalt is built as a conversation starter, sure. probably offering such knee slappers as, what are you trying to do, give yourself a heart attack, or hey Lot, miss your wife much? <laughs> that little Old Testament humor little there, Old Derek, Testament humor. going way back. Yeah, there we go. The early parts of the Bible. <laughs> hey, Lot, miss your wife much salt. Get it? Salt, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I got to make sure everybody gets it. Oh, well, you jokes. forgot to mention that it actually communicates <laughs> to your phone. <laughs> it does, that's right. <laughs> communicate, well, yeah. we're going to get to that. Or your wife's this phone. this is important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, next, there is what's known as the happy fork. Oh, my gosh. This little beauty is an electronic fork that, quote, helps you monitor and track your eating habits. It also alerts you with the help of indicator lights and gentle vibrations when you're eating too fast. But if you're like me and you eat most of your meals with your hands, I guess you're out of luck, right? I, mean, I just ignore those vibrations. I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care. Gone in 60 seconds. <laughs> Shovel it in your mouth. name over here. It goes for his meals. But yeah, I don't know how that yeah. would work if you don't use it for it. But the next one is if your kids just won't brush their teeth, you might consider the augmented reality <laughs> magic toothbrush. That's right. Aye, aye. This device tracks the length and quality of brushing time by analyzing the toothbrush, toothbrush's position in the mouth and the brushing movements the user is choosing. Okay. Okay, sounds that good. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. I mean, using combination with a cell phone or a tablet camera, the magic toothbrush fosters engagement with brushing uh, by employing all sorts of fun and weird little image overlays for the kid to see as she or he is brushing away. It's kind of like an Instagram filter, but with teeth, which is actually kind of scary to think about. I hope yeah. that would really be all that great. So all these products, okay, and many more are in homes right now or they're grinding their way through R&D or, or sales and marketing protocols. The question Ryan asks is why? I mean, is there really a screaming need on the market for these types of products? I mean, as he writes in the article subhead, because we can, is not a solid foundation 
for product development. You can see it right there. And there's actually another issue here, one that's, that's I think is pretty scary, and that's the issue of, of cybersecurity. I mean, all these connected devices, many of which, as we saw, maybe, are extraneous at best, are just increasing our risks of exposure online. I mean, sure, it's funny when your salt shaker yells at you, your fork starts vibrating during that third plate of pasta, <laughs> uh, or your kid's toothbrush says, hey, you missed a spot. But all of those reminders are based on what? They're based on data, right? right. They're based on information that's acquired uh, and tracked. And this is data about those of us that use these devices, along with products such as Fitbits, uh, which record a lot of information about their users. I mean, there's legitimate concerns about bad actors potentially accessing so much of our personal information. And that's something that I'm certainly concerned about. I mean, right. think about it. I mean, you know, there's, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. Some people think this is overblown and that right, know, this right. whole idea about, well, it has all this data on you. Well, there's so much data. How is any one person's data going to be really used and found? But the data's out there. It's out there right. to be hacked, to be obtained in some way. Privacy concerns are, are a concern. I mean, We've all heard the thing about, you know, you put a little piece of tape over your, over your camera. <laughs> over your, device, your camera, right, right. right. Yeah. I mean, there's legitimate concerns. Real people who are in these fields are saying, well, you know, these are smart things you should, you know, be wary of, be aware of. And um, be careful about your habits. Don't leave so many digital footprints maybe online. So I, I am of two minds of this. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm kind of like, well, it's a legitimate concern. I'm not that worried about it because the mountain of data out there, I'm like, who's going to know or even find me? My right, little right, bit right. of it out there, right? right? But it could be found. I mean, hacks happen. You know, we've seen it in many, many yeah. areas. So, I mean, how, how do you think of it? What do you feel about that? You know, I, I guess I don't, I don't worry about it. And it's interesting because we're, we're going to have a guest coming up here in a couple of minutes right, who's right. actually going to be talking about cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the real danger, and maybe we can talk to Martin about this, is the data mining aspect. So by itself, does anybody really care about your salt intake? Right. Well, if somebody also had access to your medical records, right. and they can start doing some, gee, this guy seems to be eating a lot, I can tell from his happy fork, <laughs> and his smalt keeps saying this guy, you know, <laughs> drinks salt from the salt shaker, and hey, look at that, look at, look at his medical records, looks like this guy might have some, some heart problems, hey, maybe we're not going to sell him insurance. Right. Right? So, I mean, if all that data can be aggregated, and data mining is a big thing, and they can start connecting these pieces, maybe there's some implications. We actually, we talked about this last week. Maybe there is some, uh, some, some implications for how this data might be used um, by not necessarily criminals, yeah. but by insurance companies. Well, I know some people don't draw the distinction there, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying is, I mean, it, yeah. some ethical issues there. I, 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 I don't know. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're being a little overly dramatic here. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, if so, you can maybe go ahead and take our advice uh, with a grain of small. Oh, thank you. I had to. Thank you I had to do it. Take oh, our advice with a grain of small. You see what I did there? I, I can explain that joke. I, no, don't. If you feel like <laughs> you anybody out there. You have to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so I mentioned just earlier, uh, just a few seconds ago, about... Um, cybersecurity, and our next guest is about that. Let me set this up a little bit. In just a few months, the European Union, uh, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, is going to take effect. And this regulation replaces the EU's 20-year-old data protection directive, and it imposes some new and more rigorous requirements on any entity, any company, that collects or maintains personal consumer data. And this includes companies, believe it or not, outside, located outside of the EU. In his ar article, Are You Ready for the EU's General Data Protection Regulation? Martin Volk, Senior Security Analyst with Tufsud America, provides some background on the origins of the GDPR and some of the key aspects of the regulation. And uh, we're lucky to have Martin with us in the studio this morning to give us a brief overview of the GDPR and what it could mean for companies that collect that kind of information. Good morning, Martin. Good morning, Mike and Dirk. Good to have you on the show um, once again. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. So briefly, just kind of lay out for us, you know, in, in essence, what is the EU's GDPR? Uh, it's a data regulation um, law, so to speak, which defines how data of EU citizens uh, is handled, processed, and controlled. Um, we are talking here about strengthening the ability of EU citizens to gain control back over their data. 
So what does it do? I mean, what does it do? What does it do? Uh, and what does it make uh, companies and organizations do this GDPR? Okay, so first and foremost, it defines like a set of uh, data protection standard. It's uh, very comparable to, for example, if you look at PCI, it defines like a, a rule set and a framework on how data is being processed, handled, and dealt with. Um, particularly data here in this in this scenario from EU citizens. Then secondly, um, there are huge fines involved if there is a data breach or the data is not handled accordingly. Um, so we're talking about 4% of the annual turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is higher. So there, there is serious, um, you know, I wouldn't say threats, but serious penalties for those who are not complying to these regulations. Um, it, it also sets, for example, uh, due dateline's for when there was a data breach, how much time do you have in order to um, inform the authorities? So you have 72 hours to inform authorities of a data breach or data leakage, and the users need to be formed right away. So there's, there's a lot of regulations, tight regulations for data protection on this, and it's coming into full force on May the 25th, 2018. So just in a few months uh, down the line. And how does it allow users, I mean, what's kind of the protocols that users can take uh, if, the, if there is a breach? I mean, now, do the users appeal to the EU? I mean, what's actually the, the methodology in which users can, can, uh, can apply or, or can complain if, if their data has been breached? Yeah, so, so the, the users get, get the full control back over, over their assets. So for example, they, they can go to some, someone called the data protection officer. So GDPR outlines that every company dealing with EU data or EU citizen data has a data protection officer. And then they can actually go there and demand all sorts of things like, first of all, they can get access to their data, what is being stored about me, um, they can get the data removed, which is an important factor. So for example, if uh, classic example, I bought something in a bookstore uh, in the US, for example, and but I don't want that my data is retained, you know, or, or that I'm being kept um, in their database. So this is something where the end users actually have, have the ability to say like, hey, I want to know what's happening with my data and what, what will be done with my data. So when, when you're talking about data, I mean, it sounds like we're talking about, well, as you said, personal data, things like you know, my name, how much I paid for a product, what product I bought, maybe my medical records, that kind of stuff. But does this also include tracking information, like leaving cookies on websites, where I visited, does it include that information as well? Absolutely, yeah, it includes that as well. So I mean, we are talking about the general data, um, which is usernames, passwords, um, date of birth, for example, but it also even, it goes down to that level that uh, the storing of an IP address, you know, like if you are accessing a server or a payment system and of course you leave your trail, you came from this IP address, for example, or there is user behavior being stored, you know, which is commonly referred to as cookies. So in order to present you with more specific and targeted ads, that's also a part it can be, you know, like your passport number, for example, if you make a flight booking, uh, any personal information, really, um, driver license information, your license plate of your car, um, what, whatever is personal information is falling under that regulation. So that, that's interesting. So, so users could request that, what, that, that a company not store their username and password, for instance, their, their login credentials for, I don't know, a website or a booking agency or whatever? Uh, in theory, yes. I mean, in practical terms, there's obviously, there's, there's the user going out and the user usually doesn't want to purchase anything. So let me give you an example, like if, if I'm located in Germany or in the EU and I'm going to a US website, I need to provide certain information in order to complete a transaction or purchase. Um, we are talking here more about you know, how is this data being stored? And I do have the right to get that erased 
after I uh, completed the transaction. Ah, okay. And so it, it's giving the user more control over the data. And it's it, like how it currently stands, data is usually gone. Once you enter it somewhere, you don't know what's happening to your data. And it, it's an aim of the European Union to actually give control back over that data to the end user. Okay, now it sounds to me that this is something that affects, obviously, it's a it's an EU law, so it affects companies in the EU, but you kind of implied that it doesn't matter, you, that it could apply uh, to, to companies that are outside the EU as well? Absolutely, yeah, and it does, and this is a, it's a global challenge, to be honest, because it will apply to any business worldwide, regardless where they're based, uh, in the minute if they collect information about EU citizens. Hmm. And so a couple of examples here are hotels. If you do a hotel booking in the United States, then you will have to leave personal information. If you do flight bookings, if you shop in an online store in the US, um, you will basically have to be GDPR compliant. And it's not a directive, it's actually a law enforced by the European Union. So um, I see a lot of challenges moving forward. Not, not only the language barrier, but there's, there's a lot of other aspects in, in that regard as well. well. But bottom line really is, you know, any company worldwide which is processing data of EU citizens is subject to that regulation. Wow. So, I mean, thinking about, I mean, so obviously, you know, Quality Digest has a website. We have an online store. So does that mean that if we have... Uh, customers in the EU who want to buy a training video or something that we have to comply with the GDPR? That is absolutely correct. What, yeah. what, happens, what happens if we don't? <laughs> um, you may, I mean, it, it, yeah, time will tell. The law isn't in place yet, but um, there will be lawsuits for sure. Um, I think initially, and that's, that's my personal take, um, the EU will more go after the big fish, you know, talking sure. Amazon, Netflix, cloud providers, and these guys, um, not so much the small, medium-sized businesses, but in theory, they could actually come after you and say, like, you are not GDPR compliant, and we will impose you with a fine. If you don't comply to this, you may not be able to do business in the European Union, or collect data from European Union citizens, or we put you on a blacklist that, right, right, right. Um, you know, then that's that's the end of that. Wow, interesting. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an interesting topic, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow, okay, so if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I am, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we and uh, Tufsud are presenting a webinar called Are You Ready for the EU's General Data Protection Regulation on Tuesday, February 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, Martin Volk here is um, going to be the presenter and I'll be hosting. Uh, I'll be hosting and listening really closely because this sounds like this affects us as well. It, should, it sounds like it affects everybody. Uh, so keep an eye on in your email for that invitation to that webinar um, and about how you can re register. Um, wow. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for joining us this morning and we'll be seeing you next week to talk about all this. Thank you. So all right. Thanks, thanks, Martin. We'll see you on Tuesday. Wow. The things you learned, Dirk. Jeez. Well, you know, but yeah, I mean, this is, we actually talked yeah. about this, is like, you know, how much yeah. are small organizations affected by these types of things? I mean, yeah. we play internationally. Yeah. And yeah, as he yeah. just said, we're going to wow, have to that's, be aware. Well, because he, I mean, I doubt if they would necessarily come after a small company, but they could block your site from not, I mean, it's like all of a sudden quality die just doesn't show up in, in, the, EU, in the EU. In the EU. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's easy to do. Yeah, uh, and they, also <laughs> it's a major market, so it's like something you need to be, you need to be, need to be aware of. No wow, doubt. okay, well, we got a few minutes here. Let's stay with tech, because uh, we've, been, we've sure. been talking about tech all day. Um, sure. There's a lot of things going, and we've been talking about, there's all sorts of ethical things going on with data collection mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. But I think there's also, as we talked about uh, many times, there may be some ethical stuff going on with how we're using tech. And I'm thinking of mm -hmm. things like uh, human-like robots or mm -hmm. virtual reality, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, all the data that we're, we're collecting, uh, you know, kind of the big brother stuff going yeah. on. Does this, do you, Let's talk about robots. Do the, do the lifelike robots uh, 
interest you? Is that is that interesting, or is it, does it kind of freak you out, or what? What do you think? Well, there, we had we had a story last week on a very lifelike looking. Yeah. They called her uh, 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 the next news announcer, a Japanese, very lifelike yeah. looking woman robot with, with even little like yeah, facial effects, twitches yeah. and so it's like wow that's really a trip well it's it's uh and chris smith knows this better than i do the term i think it's called the uncanny valley the is uncanny valley right, yeah. right 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 uh, we talked about this before where where something where, is almost human but not quite yeah, if, it, it gives if, you it, a, if it's really really amateurishly put together robot yeah, it's, that's cool it's fine if yeah. it's if it's something that's a perfect replica that you can't tell the difference that's fine too because you don't know yeah but it's just when you get into that middle kind point between weird. the two of them where they their movements are weird and their face isn't really exactly right their eyes are a little too dead and glassy you're like Ew, it's yeah. upsetting um but yeah you know i've thought about this i mean certainly it's been a trope in science fiction and, and yeah. movies for a while um you know ex machina was a movie right, right, i, I right, saw right. i don't know if you saw that or not yep. uh, really interesting movie um you know, and the whole thing with, with the Turing test and, you know, whether you can tell right, right. even if a machine is a machine. I mean, I think that one thing that I've heard, which makes kind of sense to me, is that you're going to see, I think, um, this machinery, this technology used uh, for elder care. In, 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 right. a, in a big way, where right. I think that, you know, there'll be companions, there'll be monitors, there'll be, you know, robots, essentially, right. that will be lifelike enough to be able to act as AIDS is it, yeah, for elderly right. people who are in their homes. So a good thing. Don't go there. It's a good thing. So a good thing. Um, you know, I'm not saying that the elderly are less discriminate, discriminating in terms right, of what right. they request in a robot in terms of its lifelike abilities, but certainly it's a function. And it's also one that's hard to find people necessarily to do that job sometimes. Right. So, and there's a lot of those jobs that are going to be needed, obviously, in, in the world as the as the population ages. So that's one that I've heard of that I think is going to be a really good use for okay. this technology. Um, in in industry, I mean, it, it's already there. I mean, uh, yeah, and, right. And sure. the lifelike mm -hmm. nature of it doesn't really matter. I mean, so much. Right. I mean, you've talked a lot about how the there there's the integration of yep. people with robots, Cobots, so they right, don't have right. to really be walled off as much anymore, where right. they can be programmed to be much safer for people, for human beings to work alongside them. So that's another one. Well, are, uh, here's another question, and, and this is still along the lines of, are we going too far? So <clears throat> I was watching, there's a CNN program, um, uh, I think it's still on, uh, Anthony Bourdain's, hmm. I can't remember the name of the program, but, but yeah. really interesting. Basically, he's a, he's a chef, but he uh, travels the world tasting food, but he also yeah. gets into these interesting discussions with peoples in different countries. So I can't remember where he was, but he got talking with some entrepreneurs mm -hmm. Uh, about virtual reality, and they have an interesting virtual reality product. It's virtual reality porn. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> so you know, we've talked about this before. So you know, you put on your VR glasses, and it's like you're there. You're there. Okay. So the question is, <laughs> with stuff like that, are we simply, as humans, are we simply extending what we've always done? I mean, porn's yeah. been around since the time cavemen could draw, <laughs> draw <laughs> naked true. stick figures on, <laughs> on a cave wall, right? Yeah. So is this just simply a techn technological extension of yeah. that? Or have we reached some sort of point where now we're going too far? Huh? And I don't mean just with porn. I just, I just yeah. mean in general, are we taking technology to the point where it's kind of like, you know, we got to maybe back off a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's also been films that talk about the Avatar and things where, right. you know, uh, Surrogate was another one, I think, with Bruce Willis, I think was another one. Right. Um, yeah. But where, where basically you, humanity is no longer alive, or you're, you're basically just barely alive, but really your, your soul is out there in this virtual reality world, that seems like that could be possible, sure, in, yeah. in some sense. There's theories that say that the entire universe is just a, uh, is just a virtual reality program that's running, right? And that we're all <laughs> in it. And Living on our really flat exist. world. Right, then. exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I've often said that virtual reality porn will be the end of human civilization <laughs> okay, because kind of just like, it's yeah. like, you know, when, when men in particular can have any sexual experience they want and it's real, real, yeah. real, real, basically real. Yeah. Why have an interaction with an actual female who's got her own desires and, and issues? Well, I mean, and, and, and again, just b backing away from that a little bit, I mean, there has been all that concern about, you know, kids who kind of start to lack, uh, some people say, sure. a social life because they're, yeah. they're just, hey, you know, all their they're, friends they're just are here all the time. I'm, you know, I'm on Facebook, right. you know, I, I can Skype, I can do whatever. Why do I need to meet in person? And when, the, I, and I when there's not even a device, I mean, what, what will happen as you, you go forward with this is there wouldn't even be devices. I mean, this will be in your brain. The sensors in your brain will 
basically with a flick of the eye get right. you into reality or virtual reality. Right, 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 right. And at that point, it's going to be so blurred that you're going to not know the, not know the difference. I wish I, there's a yeah. book. There's a book about this where uh, um, it's kind of a, 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 a adult teen novel. And I wish I could remember the name of it. It was really good. It's about, but it's exactly it's the world where everybody is. I mean, the real world exists, but very few people engage in it. In, engage in it. Everybody's just basically plugged in and living their entire lives. Yeah. Aside from getting food, uh, yeah. living their entire lives online. Oh, that, that, they mean, have a movie coming up. I keep on talking about movies. Probably the same. Uh, <laughs> Ready, Ready Player One. Oh, Ready is, Player is that, One. That That's it. it. Oh man, this is an new, interesting new, book. New Spielberg movie. Yeah, yeah. Coming out. Really good. Yeah. So really good. I mean, these are these are things that have been in the culture for a while. I yeah. think people have been thinking about these issues and they're starting to come to fruition to a certain extent. I yeah. mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that we see right now, you say with the, the younger generation, right, these kids today. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was in a doctor's office where, you know, the other day and there was uh, some kids in there and every one of them was like, and on money the adults too. We're just like, <laughs> right, nobody right. talking to anybody, nobody reading a magazine, everybody right. just, and their own little, and yeah. it also affects the, the socialization, socialization of people. Yeah. Um, what well, some people claim, some people say I, it's I, not really. No, I okay. think that is it. Okay. I think that is it. I mean, I know people that are, you know, in their teens or their preteens, and I can't remember that well. It seems to me that in my day we were a little more engaging of others, okay. um, even adults. Certainly, our peer group. You engage yeah. with your peer group to play or do things or talk. Now you don't do that. You still engage with your peer group, but you do it online. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, you see kids. It's it's the old joke about the fact that you know, two kids are in the cafeteria. They're sitting right next to each other and texting each other on their right. phones, right? And they're like sitting right there. It actually happens. You know. Well, I'll I'll finish this up, but just it's it's interesting when we think about these is that <clears throat> all this technology that we're talking about. It has two sides of it. Well, I mean, and I, I mean, two two sides in terms of where it's operating. One is kind of on the consumer side, the everyday you know person side. The other is, if you think about it, all these same technologies we're talking about, whether it's robotics or VR or augmented reality or whatever, are making huge uh, inroads in uh, in manufacturing mm -hmm. and in oh, yeah. how we do business because it does make it makes manufacturing easier, it makes customer service easier, uh, it makes online customer service uh, easier. Easier. Sure does. I mean, I, I do so much chatting with tech support now, and it's gotten to the point where it's actually not too bad. It used right. to be really sucked, but now it's like chatting tech support. Eh, they've gotten it down now. It's it's, it's okay. I don't mind it. You know, it's good it's, enough. It's, yeah. it's good enough. Um, and it, it's just interesting how these technologies just blossom, and then of course, then they each find their niche in different in in different parts of the in the, different parts of the world: manufacturing, customer service, the market, porn, yeah, the, <laughs> whatever. The, yeah, the, the power of the market. Yeah. you know, Adam Smith was so right about that two hundred plus years ago. You know, the hidden hand of the market. I mean, it, it does it does very efficiently organize services and products to where they can most be used. And hey, yes, there's pros and cons. If there wasn't, yeah. we wouldn't even have this discussion. If there right. wasn't clear benefits to this, this stuff, then we would say, well, heck, we're not going to do that. That's terrible. Right? Yeah, but right, I mean, right, right. There obviously, are benefits, there's yeah. a lot of benefits in yeah. industry and for people as well. You know, I mean, it, it's incredible to be able to, I, I, I live on my smartphone too. I love it, right? Yeah, Who yeah. doesn't? But yeah. I mean, it, it does have pros and cons. And I, I think the issues that you're raising there are really good ones. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. And then there's the security issues that security Mark was talking are, about. Yeah, so that's right, that's right. Uh, uh, you're going to want be be sure to watch that, <laughs> come and watch that webinar next week. So. That's right, that's right. And speaking of which, yes, we want to do thank Martin Volk for joining us on today's show from, from Two Suit America. Um, we are having a webinar, as Dirk mentioned, next week on Tuesday, the 13th of February. Uh, are you ready for the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR? Uh, that webinar is coming up on Tuesday, as mentioned, the 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Martin's going to be presenting, and Dirk right here is going to be your host. Uh, and you can register in the link uh, down below Martin's article. Martin's article is on our player page down here. Uh, you can check out, check out a link there, or you can just look for your email, because we'll have an email reminder for you on Monday to go out and register for that webinar on Tuesday. There you go. Well, that's our show. So you guys all have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. So long. Bye.